Hello beautiful people, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Brina and today is an episode of Didn't Make Up the Mystery. As I said in the last video in this series that I did, I still don't love the name, but I don't know what else to call this series because yeah. I did not have a new video on Wednesday because I'm trying this new thing where maybe if I do these videos every other week, I'll actually be able to get them up if I don't do a Wednesday video. So let me know in the comments if you're cool with me skipping a Wednesday video and doing more of these Saturday series videos. I still don't know what to call it, like I just said. If you have any better name suggestions for the series, let me know in the comments. I had something completely entirely different from what I'm gonna talk about originally planned for today. And then I started researching it and I got bored. And I really think the way that I wanna go with this series is to mainly just talk about serial killers. So today we're gonna be talking about Jesse Pomeroy. He is considered the youngest serial killer in the United States. And we'll get into why I put air quotes, quotes around a serial killer a little bit later in the story. I don't wanna spoil anything for you guys. And I'm sure by now you all know how much I hate long intros. So let's get right into today's video. Jesse Harding Pomeroy. Pomeroy, also known as the boy fiend or the boy with the marble eye, was born November 29th, 1859 in Charlestown, Massachusetts. So as I'm sure you can tell, um, this happened a very long time ago, so there's not going to be a whole lot of pictures in this story. I know, disappointing, but I'm going to do what I can for you. Jesse was the second son to Thomas and Ruth Ann Pomeroy. He had an older brother, Charles, who was about two years older than him. While Jesse was a very intelligent kid, he really just did not fit into this world from the very beginning. Like I said, he was known as the boy with the marble eye. Well, his eye I was actually a birth defect. He was born with a white film on his right eye that was so thick it basically covered his entire pupil. And on top of that birth defect, he was tall for his age. And he also suffered from periodic epileptic seizures. So needless to say, Jesse was bullied a lot as a child. Jesse was pretty antisocial and a loner. I mean, I don't really blame the kid. You know, if people are picking on you for things out of your control, you tend to not really want to associate with other people, you know what I mean? So he spent a lot of his time alone reading violent tales about the Indian Wars. And in the rare instances where he actually did want to play with other children his age, usually he would want to play a game he called Scouts and Indians. He often would play as an Indian himself and he would reenact the torture methods he read about in his books. So as if Jesse's life wasn't already hard enough, he suffered from a physical deformity, he had no friends, he was constantly getting made fun of. His older brother Charles never really wanted to spend any time with him. I mean, like older brothers do, you know. His father would often subject him to some pretty horrific physical abuse. Starting at a very young age, he would commonly take Jesse out to the outhouse and order him to strip naked, and then he would whip him or just hit him until blood was drawn. So because he couldn't rely on his father, obviously, or his brother as a companion, the only person in his life who he felt comfortable with was his mother. So him and his mother, Ruth Ann, were pretty close, but it's not as though a mother's love can cure it all. Ruth Ann was not at all blind to the fact that there was something wrong with her son. I mean, obviously he's got a physical deformity, but he can get over that, you know? It's the fact that his behavior progressively started getting worse. He would steal money from her, which she knew about. He often played hooky from school, again, she knew about. And one day, his mother came home from work to find that he had killed her beloved pet canaries by tearing off their heads. At one point, he was also caught torturing a neighbor's cat with a knife and at no point in all this did his mother think oh there is something very wrong with my child no she just kind of encouraged his behavior i, I guess you could say because she didn't really try to prevent it she didn't try to get him help so by 1871 jesse's behavior takes a very i wouldn't say like a dramatic turn because you know he already was doing some pretty weird stuff but in 1871, in the little town of Chelsea, which is a suburb of Boston, very close to where the Pomeroys were living at the time, a little boy named Billy Payne was found in an isolated outhouse. He had rope tied around his wrists and he was hanging from the ceiling. He was semi-undressed, badly beaten, and suffering 
from hypothermia. A few months after that, on February 21st, 1872, seven-year-old Tracy Hayden was lured to the same abandoned outhouse. He was also bound, stripped naked, and whipped across the back. His attacker then struck him in the face with a board, breaking his nose and knocking out two teeth. He then threatened to cut off his penis and unlike the first boy, Tracy was able to describe his attacker to at least some lengths. He described him as a big boy with brown hair. I mean, it's not a super great description, but he is also seven, so I get it. And then on May 20th of that same year, eight-year-old Robert Meyer was taken to that same abandoned warehouse and received similar treatment as Tracy Hayden. Over the next few weeks, Chelsea police questioned hundreds of boys, but they were unable to identify this mysterious attacker and no arrests were made. Around the same time, rumors started circulating around Chelsea and the surrounding areas with a new description of this young attacker. He was described as a young man with fiery red hair, pale skin, arched eyebrows, a pointy chin, and a wispy red beard. So basically they were describing the devil. Um, yeah, this is definitely not an accurate description, but this is what started to make its rounds. On July 22nd, after seven-year-old Johnny Balk was stripped naked and whipped, the press dubbed the assailant the boy torturer, and a $500 reward was offered for his capture. The press also started to use this new description of the devil in their papers and blah blah blah, so you know, basically really nobody has any clue who the identity of this boy torturer is. And as it turns out, just two days before the attack on seven-year-old Johnny Ball, Jesse Pomeroy had received his most severe beating yet from his his father. Ruth Ann had enough of her husband and chased him out of the family home with a knife. A few days later, she and the children moved to South Boston where she opened a dress shop. And then can you guess what started happening in South Boston? Yes, you are correct. The assaults moved to South Boston at this point. On August 17th, 1872, seven-year-old George Pratt is abducted. This time, his captor goes further than he ever had with any of his other victims. He stuck needles in his arm and groin, bit chunks of flesh from his face and buttocks. Then on September 5th, the assailant strikes again, once again devolving. This time, he used a knife to stab six-year-old Harry Austin under the arms and between the shoulder blades. He also attempted unsuccessfully to cut off his penis. Less than a week after that attack, he abducts six-year-old Joseph Kennedy and once again uses a knife on him. He cuts him and then throws salt water on his wounds. Six days after that incident, wielding two knives, he slashes a five-year-old Robert Gold's scalp and threatens to kill him. But luckily for Robert, the attack was interrupted by two approaching railroad workers. Robert was able to get away and now finally somebody has taken a good look at the their attacker because up, up until this point none of these boys were able to give a very good description of their attacker they all just descri described him as a big boy with brown hair not a very good description but now five-year-old robert gold the youngest of all the victims tells detectives a big bad boy with a funny eye is the one who attacked him so finally they're onto something here. So police are finally like, Wayne, he has a funny eye? And he said, yes, it's Milky. So now we know Jesse Pomeroy is the boy torturer. I'm sure you figured that out a long, long time ago. But with this new information, police want to take Robert to all the local schools. But because Robert was so badly injured, his scalp required stitches and his parents just did not feel comfortable letting him go. I mean, I don't blame them. I wouldn't want my five-year-old to be subjected to anything like that either, but the 1800s are a very different time from what we lived in today. So instead, they took the boy who was attacked just before Robert, Joseph Kennedy, in hopes that he could possibly identify his attacker from the boys sitting in the classrooms. So detectives take Joseph Kennedy to the local classrooms, even taking him to Jesse Pomeroy's class. But Joseph is still unable to positively identify his attacker. So by now, it seems like Jesse's probably 
ain't gonna get away with it, right? Well, that same day after school, for reasons unknown, Jesse decides to go down to the local police station. He walked in and then saw Joseph Kennedy and immediately turned around and walked back out, but not before another police officer saw him. So that cop goes after Jesse and brings him back inside, wondering what this boy wants. And when he comes back inside, Joseph Kennedy realizes that is his attacker. Jesse was then held in a jail cell overnight and eventually he confesses to his crimes after he was threatened with a 100 year prison sentence. After admitting his guilt in all of the attacks, Jesse was sentenced to live in the Westboro Boys Reform School until he turned 18. So he basically he was sentenced for six years because he was 12 years old at the time. However, Jesse, uh, like I said, is an intelligent boy. So he quickly figures out that his key to getting out early is good behavior. He was a very well-behaved patient. Um, um student? I don't know. I don't know what you want to call it. He always made sure to do his work. He applied himself to his studies. He even went as far as snitching on his fellow classmates or whatever you want to call the other people who lived in the reform school with him. While Jesse was busy being a perfect example of a well-reformed boy, his mother Ruth Ann was on the outside continually pressing for his release. She was convinced that her precious baby boy Jesse was framed and eventually she got her way and on January 24th, 1874, less than 17 months after his arrest, Jesse Pomeroy was released from the Westboro Boys Reform School. Then on March 18th, just six weeks after Jesse's release, 10-year-old Katie Curran left her home to buy a notebook for school and she would never be seen again. She was last seen entering Ruth Ann Pomeroy's store where Jesse worked. But police searched the store, interrogated Jesse, and nothing was found. They were able to clear him. The police captain even went as far as reassuring Katie's mother that Jesse was a rehabilitated boy, but more so, he was only known known for attacking little boys, so there's no way he could have had anything to do with this, right? Well, then rumors started to circulate that her father, who was a devout Catholic, possibly sent her away to a convent or something of that nature. But as it turns out, <laughs> Jesse had been repeatedly trying to lure young boys away with him ever since he was released from the reform school. But he was always unsuccessful because everybody around knew about Jesse's reputation. So the little boys were either too smart and wouldn't go with him, or if they did go with him, an adult would step in and whisk the boys away because they knew exactly what fate laid ahead for them. But then on April 22nd, four-year-old Horace Millen disappears. His body was found the following day mutilated in a pit on the beaches of South Boston. His body was discovered by two brothers nearly naked and stabbed six times in the chest. His head was also nearly severed and he had been partially castrated. When police arrived at the scene, people immediately started thinking about Jesse Pomeroy, but the Boston police chief thought he was still locked up until people started telling him, no, he's been released. And at that point, he ordered his immediate arrest. So while they were out looking for Jesse to arrest him, the investigation continued on the beach and police were able to find a footprints left behind by the two boys. They were able to make a plaster cast of the larger footprint left behind and it turned out to be a perfect match for Jesse's shoes. After his arrest, Jesse was questioned and confronted with all the evidence laid before him, but he still refused to confess. So police took another drastic measure to try to obtain a confession from Jesse. This time they took Jesse to the funeral parlor to view the body of the boy he had just murdered. Immediately after viewing the body, Jesse broke down and admitted to killing Horace Millen. He said, quote, put me somewhere so I can't do such things. Although after he was assigned a lawyer, he had later recanted his confession. 
As I'm sure you can imagine, the notoriety for Ruth Ann's dress shop eventually forced her to sell it. I mean, her son is a, an admitted murderer at this point, so yeah, people probably aren't shopping at her store. So she sold the store and it ended up being bought by Nash's grocery store. They decided to do renovations and while doing the renovations, workers noticed this terrible smell coming from the basement. They decided to check out the source of the smell and that is when they decided discovered Katie Curran's decaying body. Ruth Ann and Jesse's older brother Charles were arrested for Katie's murder. Police let Jesse know that they had found Katie's body and that his mother and brother were being charged. But I think police kind of knew that Jesse was probably the real culprit here, so they began questioning him very aggressively until finally he confessed to the murder. As it turns out, on the day Katie entered Ruth Ann's shop, Jesse had been the only one working. Katie asked if they carried notebooks and Jesse told her to come downstairs to see if they had any left. Okay, I had to go off camera to do my liner because I was never gonna finish it if I kept talking through it. So anyways, back to the story. In Jesse's confession, he lets the police officers know that he was the only one working on the day that Katie entered his mother's shop. He says that when she came in, she asked if they had any notebooks, and he says he told her to follow him downstairs to see if they had any left down there. Once he got her into the cellar, he says he slashed her throat and stabbed her genitals repeatedly, quote, to see how she would react. He then hid her body under a pile of ashes behind a water closet before washing himself up and returning to work. So Jesse never formally went on trial for Katie's murder, but initially his lawyer was going to have him plead innocent to the murder of Horace Millen, but then after they discovered Katie's body and all of that, his lawyer aimed to get him acquitted due to reason of insanity. The trial lasted only four days, and during that time, the prosecution introduced who had found the body of Horace Millen, and also those that had reported seeing Horace with a bigger boy the same day that he disappeared. Some of the witnesses were even able to identify Jesse in court as the boy they saw with Horace the day he disappeared. Since it's the late 1800s, Jesse's confession is going to be the best piece of evidence they have because there was really just not a whole lot in forensics back then. Jesse's defense argued that obviously he was innocent by reason of insanity, and they even called his victims to prove the insanity of his actions. Yeah, I don't... I don't see how they thought that was gonna work, and it didn't. They also introduced testimony from physicians and alienists who believed that Jesse was in fact insane. But like with any good trial, the prosecution had their own experts to contradict the defense's experts. They concluded that Jesse knew right from wrong and that he acted on his sinister urges anyways. In February of 1875, Jesse was found guilty of first degree murder. At the time in Massachusetts, their law required a mandatory execution for first degree murder, but the jury recommended the sentence be commuted to life in prison because of Jesse's age. The debate would rage on locally and nationally for the next year and nine months. So they were trying to decide if justice and public safety would be upheld from the hanging of Jesse or if it would be immoral to hang a boy who was only 14 years old at the time he committed his crime. After two governors refused to sign the death warrant, the matter was finally settled in August of 1876 when the Massachusetts Executive Council decided to commute Jesse's sentence to solitary confinement for the rest of his life. Jesse Pomeroy was 16 years old when he entered the Charlestown State Prison, and except for a brief period in the 1880s when the prison was being renovated, he spent the next 50 53 years there. 41 of those years he spent in solitary confinement with his only social interaction being with the prison guards and his mother who came to visit him once a month until her death. Finally, in 1917, he was allowed to join the rest of the prison population. Then in 1929, when he was in very, very poor, deteriorating health, he was moved to a prison farm where he died from natural causes on September 29, 1932. Jesse Pomeroy was 72 years old at the time of his death. So let's talk about this case. He was so young when he started doing the horrific things that he did. I don't know how I feel about it. I think, I think justice was served. I think 41 years of solitary confinement, though. 
I mean, at least they didn't kill him. He was very young. I think that all the factors of his childhood just kind of caused Jesse to become the boy that he was. I think if he didn't have a milky white eye, if his dad wasn't an abusive alcoholic, and if he actually had friends, I don't really think Jesse would have turned out the way he did. I... Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to say though. You really never know the whole nature versus nurture. So don't forget to let me know in the comments what you think. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Do you think that if Jesse would have had a better childhood, not been bullied, not been abused by his father, actually had some friends, do you think he would have turned out the way he did or do you think he would have been a regular human being? Think, don't forget to let me know if you have any better name suggestions than didn't make up the mystery. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time. Bye!